Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to turtle session tonight. We are having a Turkish pavilion. We have three guests joining us online, and we have three speakers here in the in the pavilion. And we will be talking about sea turtles tonight. Sea turtles, how they are affected from the temperature and the climate change, and also uh, their sex ratios, their migration paths, and also plastic pollution. How the pollution affects their life cycle in general, from hastings to the uh, migration and the feeding habits and so on. So before starting my talk, actually, I just want to say welcome uh, to online uh, connectors, Paolo Casale, Emilio Duncan, and Robin Snape. And uh, we have Nicole Esteban and the Doan Sözbilen here with me. And uh, we will be talking about basically these topics in the following one hour. And then we are happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. And if uh, the sequence of our talk is, uh, uh, okay. Uh, can I have the first slide, please, uh, instead of Zoom? Okay. As I introduced already the speakers, uh, we will be talking about today is uh, the sea turtles in general, but uh, uh, we were concentrating on the, on, on the mainly on the Mediterranean sea turtles, but we have Nicole Esteban, she will be covering other parts of the world with the turtles. So we'll be talking about worldwide in general. While I am giving information in sea turtles, uh, they come to the beach where we are having our holidays. They lay their eggs into the depth of around 50 to 60 centimeters of loggerhead turtles and a lot deeper for green turtles, maybe 80 to 90 centimeters, even up to one meters. And by the time they lay their eggs, day six is nobody knows. And during the incubation period, the temperature is changing their sex. And when the hastings came out after roughly two months, this is also related to the temperature. It may vary from 45 days to 65, even 70, even more, more uh, uh, longer period. This is also uh, related to the temperature. Roughly one degree of Celsius is changing four days in incubation period, roughly. And uh, sex is also determined during the middle third of the incubation period, not entirely this uh, long period in the middle third. And uh, they are, uh, after the blastocyst, when they mature enough to come up to the surface, their sex is, is determined already, but we don't really recognize any differences from outside. So we need to look at their gonads in order to understand whether they are female or male. So these hastings, when they enter to the sea, from the research that we are doing now, is about 80%, maybe in, on some beaches, 90% female dominated. And this female is basically changing from 20 days to 40 days. And these are the turtle embryos roughly every 10 days, I can say. And uh, at the bottom, uh, you will see the mature hastings. And uh, from top corner uh, to the bottom left corner is about the same, when the sex is determined. As you can see here, this is a more uh, scientific information, but obviously we uh, get their gonads from the dead hastings and we do the sections. And if there is a, uh, cortex and the medulla separation that the, you, want, uh, you see on the right hand side of the screen is a female that the tunica albuginea is present between the cortex and medulla and the oviduct is a bit oval shape at the bottom uh, you will see. Whereas uh, on the males, uh, there is no such differentiation between the cortex and medulla and the oviduct is uh, a lot oval, oval shape. And as you can see here, lower temperatures are making all the hastings 
male and the higher temperatures are making them female in general and the 29 degrees for the Mediterranean and the, for most of the turtles are threshold temperature. And uh, by taking this into account, I can give a roughly summary of the different sex ratios reported for the worldwide. As you can see, uh, it changed from 60% female to the nearly 95% female all over the world. So this is uh, one of the alerting issue that if the temperature is changing one or even one and a half degrees Celsius, we may have in the future all hastings are female. So this is a very uh, interesting information. So while we were uh, conserving sea turtles, we may take this uh, into the account in relocating the eggs or altering the beach temperatures and so on. And this is one of the recently paper came out by Maurer et al. And uh, although this uh, temperature is making a female dominated sex ratio, but after a certain temperature from 32 or 33 uh, degrees of Celsius, we start having uh, embryonic mortalities in the nest. And this is very uh, important information because we may lose majority of the hatchlings in the nest due to the temperature, higher temperatures in the nest. But what is important is in the sea, whether we have enough males for the population to have the reproduction or not. And uh, this is sex ratio that we get in the, in the water. And obviously uh, this is one of the challenging issue as well. And there are many things in addition to the climate change, plastic pollution that uh, two of our colleagues will talk later and also uh, threats at the nesting beach, as well as the high bycatch rates. Taking this all information, we have only 5% of the loggerhead turtle population in the world, in the, living in the Mediterranean only, and a very small portion of these loggerhead sea turtles. And uh, obviously, we are doing a lot to protect them. And uh, recently, uh, these uh, turtles are uh, improved in their uh, population structure and we classified them as a least concern. This is a good sign that we protect them with the support of all the nations because we need to protect them in all nations, in all countries in order to let them to survive in this world. And uh, this is a good sign. And uh, after giving this short presentation of mine, I will be introducing uh, online speakers and then one uh, presenter here. Uh, so the, the first speaker after me is Paolo Casale. Uh, he's the co-chair of the uh, IUCN Marine Turtle Specialist Group. He will be talking about uh, sea turtles in the Mediterranean in general. And then I will introduce the Hans Özbilen next and then Robin Snape and then Emily Duncan. And then finally, we will have the Nicole Esteban with us here. So uh, I will introduce now to Paolo Casale to share his screen so that we can have him. Uh, and uh, before passing floor to the Paolo, I want to thank again all the panelists and also Turkish Minister of Environment and the climate uh, change uh, issues that who invited us here to be with, uh, in this COP26. Thank you. Hi, Paolo, you can share your screen and uh, let, let's have your presentation. Yes, are you? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Uh, just and this... share your screen. Yes, I, I share my screen. Uh, it is it is shared now, I guess. Do, can you we see can that? only see an island. Is it your screen? Or... Yeah, it is my screen. <laughs> <Right>. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Now, now I can start with the presentation okay so thank you everyone thank you for invitation thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to give this presentation um i will talk today about i mean very brief and general introduction uh, about sea turtles in the mediterranean and specifically threats and the, and the main areas where they occur uh, so in the Mediterranean, we can find three turtle species 
the logarithm turtles here in in on the left, green turtles and the Ladbroke turtle here, and the last one actually does not reproduce in the in the, in the basin. So we have these two species that are the main species of the basin, and we can find them everywhere regarding logger turtles and more in the eastern basin regarding the green turtles. And uh, the good news, as uh, uh, Professor Casca told you before, is that we uh, are seeing increasing number of nesting counts in both species in the Mediterranean. Of course, they are just nest counts, so we cannot really know about the population or the individuals at sea. But I mean, it is um, a good thing to have this increase in nest counts. Regarding the, the um, where these turtles breed, that is very important for conservation because they aggregate to breed in specific nesting sites. These are a map showing that uh, the major nesting site of both species, the logger and the green turtle, occur in the Eastern Mediterranean. However, we are, we are not seeing in the recent years an increased number of nests also being observed especially um, regarding log red turtles in the, in the Western Basin. We don't know actually if it is just uh, a higher sensitivity of people who are reporting or the increase of the population in general, or possibly a, a climate change effect. It could be uh, one of the rare positive effect of climate change if it is the case. Regarding the um, foraging areas, the areas at sea where we can find the highest number of, uh, of sea turtles. Here is another map showing with these um, shallow waters in Adriatic and North Africa and other, also other places. And we see also that uh, in this case, most of them are in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. You see also the uh, green arrows showing some foraging areas known for the green turtle. So uh, when they are adult, uh, um, sea turtles need to migrate from uh, the foraging areas to the breeding grounds. So in these maps, you see the um, connection derived from uh, um, sea turtle tracking uh, satellite tracking specifically, and um, between the two locations. And so we can call them roughly uh, migratory corridors. And we see that a uh, great part of the areas in the Eastern Mediterranean are uh, corridors for migrations for the log red turtles and for the green turtles, just because uh, these two areas, the foraging areas, the breeding areas can be very far away from each other. So why it is that? Uh, there is uh, increasing um, evidence around the world, but uh, now it's just an example for the Mediterranean, that uh, the uh, juvenile dispersal of these animals is the, the reason why they choose certain uh, areas to settle as adults. So, um, the, all this is driven by currents, of course, when they are very uh, small, tiny hatchlings. And so it is possible that in future climate change could be could have some um, some effect on that, on the dispersal, initial dispersal. And so also uh, on the on the um, adult foraging areas and as a consequence also for the migration in general, migratory corridors. Now uh, we we speak about uh, the, the, the the bad things, I mean the, the, the concerns, uh, the threats, the anthropogenic threats. Um, bycatch is undoubtedly the the most important uh, uh, threat, anthropogenic threat, uh, of which we have uh, evidence, of which we can have uh, solid arguments to say that it has a population uh, uh, level effect. Um, we cannot, unfortunately, have, can say the same for other threats just because we have not uh, enough information yet. 
Uh, so certainly bycatch is a very important threat for these animals. We see here a, a map with the general distribution of uh, um, relative importance, the distribution in terms of number of captures per year of the pelagic long line, one of the fishing years most impactfully impacting uh, these animals. This is the long line, how this, uh, this long line with several branches with a hook. And it has also um, probably a very high mortality rate. So a lot of captures and uh, of these captures, of the total captured, uh, many will probably die. Another important uh, fishing gear is the, the bottom troll. Also in this case, we have uh, a lot of estimated captures per year. And as you see, it's more distributed in the Eastern uh, Basin, just because in the Eastern Basin, we have shallower water where uh, these fishing gear typically fish. The mortality varies a lot according to the duration of the hole and other parameters. So it is difficult to say. And another important fishing gear with increasing evidence as, as we get more information is the set nets. It is uh, set at the bottom of the sea and the turtles that are captured in this fishing gear usually die just because they drone. Uh, they, they cannot go in surface and breathe. And we see general distribution, but uh, it is probably very, very much underestimated. Another great concern for all of us working on these animals uh, is the potential uh, nesting habitat degradation, even destruction, uh, unavailability in the future. And because of, uh, of course, coastal development, but also because possible effect uh, of climate change, including uh, um, sea level rise. And um, so uh, given that these animals uh, nest just in a few, really few uh, nesting sites around the Mediterranean and the world in general. These are very critical uh, areas to protect. And um, adaptation also is very needed in this case, that adaptation to climate change. So to so foresee a possible shift of the beach in land. And, uh, and we need to allow this, this potential shift. So this kind of pictures that you see here describe a situation where this kind of shift would not be allowed. And in case of, of a sea level rise, the, the beach will be not longer available for these animals. Unfortunately, sea turtles are also threatened by many other threats. They're uh, kind of uh, unlucky animals. Everything we can do uh, impact them in some way or the other. Um, research is still in progress and uh, the next speaker probably will, will talk about that. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, okay thank you. Thank you Paolo for summarizing the turtle information in the Mediterranean. Now we will look at the migration patterns of sea turtles from Turkey and uh, Doan Sözbilen will be presenting this, uh, the turtles and the tracking and the, their migration routes and the feeding grounds. Please. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to, to our panel. Uh, I would like to thank the organization of this panel by Minister of Environment, Urbanization and Climate Change, and uh, thank you for your participation. Today I'm going to talk about the migration patterns and uh, why we are tracking turtles from Turkey. And uh, yes, okay, uh, Paolo Casale briefly gave great information about uh, sea turtles in the Mediterranean. I'm going to talk about more uh, from Turkish coastline turtles. When we say tracking, we mean usually we usually uh, use telemetry. This photograph, I love this photograph. This is uh, Archie Frederick Carr, uh, 
uh, roughly taken about 60 years ago. And uh, everybody aware about sea turtles and they are coming to nest and they are going in, into the sea and no one knows where they are going. And he wondered where they are going. And then he decided to put some uh, balloons and follow to, to try to track those turtles. And now we have telemetry and improved uh, technologies. And now we can have precise locations and we can uh, create fancy animations like this. This is Tuba, uh, which is very famous turtle in Turkey. It's a female loggerhead turtle. And uh, we have been tracking this turtle more than two years, which is very long time for a tracking uh, of an animal. And uh, in Turkey now we have over 6 million people viewed her map. She's, she is very famous. And okay. And this kind of uh, study is also important for public awareness. It's good. And this is the final map of her journey. Uh, she passed the second year and she's in Croatia now, she is in the north. We were expecting her to go south, but she continued to uh, north path. But following one turtle is not enough. Uh, one individual is not giving a proper map. When we look at another map that we have been following from 2020, there are, there are eight different turtles. This map is more similar to the maps of the Paolo Casales presentation. And uh, we need more turtles to have a, an idea. Uh, sea turtles have been tracked since 1982, I think. But in Turkey, uh, these kind of studies are new. In the last 10 years, the numbers increased. Uh, last year, the uh, Minister of Environment supported eight turtles, the uh, tracking of eight turtles, and this year they supported 10 more turtles, so we will have more information. And uh, why we are uh, tracking turtles, what we get, uh, the first one is collecting data and increase uh, knowledge about their biology. And also it's important to have a baseline data because uh, by the climate change, the environment is changing and uh, we don't know what, where are they going uh, from the Turkish coast and where are they using in the Mediterranean. So we need a baseline and uh, the time is passing quickly and we are trying to figure out where are they going and uh, which migratory corridors they are using and what are their uh, behavior. And also it helps us to predict the possible future effects of climate change on migration and behavior again. And also uh, the effects, uh, the, the selection of the nesting beaches, is there going to be a difference? Uh, as you can remember from the previous presentation, there are some sporadic nesting events in the Western Mediterranean. Is it going to happen in Turkey? Uh, we can track turtles and uh, the most important part is the mitigation because there are lots of threats and we have to implement some uh, mitigation measures, but where we are going to implement these measures. So if we know where the turtles are going, we will have uh, more uh, proper conservation uh, in the future. Now, uh, our team uh, with the Italian colleagues and Paolo Casaglia was also the one of the co-author just accepted last week. And uh, we tracked 17 turtles in the last past year. And uh, we have an, uh, a map now for the loghead turtles from the Dalian beach uh, mainly. And as you can see, the map is very similar to the other uh, migra migration corridors, but and also you can see more turtles in the aging coast of uh, aging part of the Mediterranean, and also uh, lots of turtles also using Turkish coasts, especially in the southern uh, aging coast, uh, which is important. We also uh, follow two turtles to Israel and uh, Egypt side, and uh, we get 
some different informations. Another uh, paper just accepted last week again uh, with several uh, from the several different countries, and uh, we tried to uh, find where our turtles are foraging, the adult turtles, and uh, the purple polygons shows the foraging areas, and the red areas are also uh, the hotspot risk points. So it's important to know where our turtle, uh, turtle are living and also where are the threats. So it's important and it requires uh, international collaboration to create such maps and uh, results. But this is not enough. We need more detailed information, especially when you talk about mitigation. For example, this is from the three turtles. Those three turtles use the same area. When we came into the smaller scale, and uh, you can see how where, how they are using an area. So if you are going to implement a mitigation measure here, uh, we can say, okay, where uh, we should implement this measure. Uh, if you look at this laser, the yellow parts, all three turtles have different behavior, different uh, aerial usage, but all three turtles are using the same area, same spot. So if you are going to implement a mitigation measure, the first place you have to choose is here. And also another thing, uh, the climate change, as Professor Kaska explained, uh, the increasing temperatures affecting sea turtles. And uh, we think that increasing uh, temperatures produce more female hatchlings. But these data are from this year. Uh, we look at some incubation temperature this year and we estimated female ratio statistically. And then uh, when we look at the temperature, temperatures were really high and we look at the hatching success, it's really low. Some uh, nests didn't produce any nests. So, this is not good for the future populations. So in the future, we are expecting a warmer Mediterranean. Uh, this paper was published 10 years ago and they uh, projected the next 100 years and we were expecting a, a warmer Mediterranean. And now we are uh, getting the signs of warming and also, we started to see more turtles in the northern uh, coordinates. Uh, so maybe turtles are looking for better places, maybe cooler places. We have to monitor this, but we have to know how they are following these rules and how they are finding these beaches. And is there any changes between uh, the past uh, migrat migration behavior and the future? So it's important to have information uh, in the water. And also uh, with the increased technology, developed technology, we are getting location of the turtles and also we are getting some uh, uh, environmental information such as the temperatures. So we are collecting uh, precise uh, seawater temperature and we can create more detailed maps we created this map this uh, we have very few data right now uh, we have limited number of turtles but when we have more data in the future we will have a better explanation for the mediterranean but when you look at the uh, yellow part which means warmer it is close to the migration patterns of the turtles and the Eastern Mediterranean is much more warmer than the uh, other parts. And also when you look at the Turkish coast, uh, our turtles are started to use the South Asian coast and uh, this place is also warmer than the other areas. So uh, by uh, tracking turtles, we are getting this kind of information and uh, we can uh, implement more efficient mitigation measures in the future. 
And uh, to do this, we cannot do by ourselves. We need collaboration and we have to implement mitigations together. Now we have uh, in a, uh, four different consortium. Uh, one, uh, the first one is Life Met Turtles. Uh, is, mm countries from uh, Mediterranean countries, Spain, Italy, Albania, and uh, Turkey, and Tunisia is involved in this project. And we are tr uh, trying collaboratively uh, collecting data in the water, especially. Uh, and we have another project, Mava uh, Foundation funded project, Conservation of Marine Tortoise. This uh, project is also, again, uh, have lots of partners from different countries and also in this project, which is about the marine litter problem, uh, which is very important because uh, with the climate change, uh, we are predicting uh, the distribution of the plastics and the marine litter in the sea. And we are trying to understand where turtles are going and we, we are going to see what will happen in the future. And uh, the other project is Met Bycatch pro, uh, project. Uh, this is especially uh, for important project for the mitigation because it's uh, aiming at bycatch issue in the Mediterranean. So when we work together, in collaboration with other uh, countries, uh, we can implement much better implementation and mitigation measures in the future. And thank you all for listening to me. And thank you our uh, supporters. Yes. Okay, thank you, Doan. It's really important to understand the 99% of the life cycle spans in the water. We, we can probably protect them better on the, on the beaches or on the nest side, but this is only 1% of their life cycle. And uh, this is what we heard turtles where they are migrating from Turkey by Doğan. Now, the next speaker will be talking about uh, the turtles where they are migrating from Cyprus. We have Dr. Robin Snape from Exeter University, and he has, he has been doing many research in the Cyprus, and we are collaborating again with the, with the projects that just Doan mentioned. So please uh, have your speech, uh, Robin, and we would like to hear more about the uh, turtles uh, from Cyprus. Thank you. Uh, you need to, okay, yeah. Many, many thanks, Professor Kas Kaskar. Uh, for the invitation and the uh, opportunity to, um, to share our work in uh, Northern Cyprus at the uh, COP26. Um, so I've been working in Cyprus since uh, 2003. There's a, a local NGO there called the Society for Protection of Turtles, SPOT, um, and we've been collaborating with uh, British universities for um, nearly three decades, um, whilst also working together with um, collaborators in other countries such as Jakob and, uh, and Paolo. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the satellite tracking of uh, green and loggerhead turtles after they've been nesting in northern Cyprus and where they're going and how climate change might be affecting them. So this is a study site. Uh, on the left hand side we have the Mediterranean and the island of Cyprus and in Cyprus we have both loggerhead turtles and green turtles uh, similar to Turkey. Um, there are different areas of the, uh, the north coast of Cyprus that we work in, uh, on the west coast at uh, the Athenis area. Uh, we have mostly dom dominated by loggerhead nesting there, shaded in black. Um, Alagadi, which is a really important site in the centre of the north coast, um, that's mostly dominated by green turtles and it's an important nesting beach um, for the Mediterranean. And then in the Carpaz region, um, there are big, big nesting numbers of uh, green green turtles and smaller nesting numbers of loggerhead turtles. And then in Famagusta Bay, um, we have uh, quite a lot of loggerhead turtles nesting. So we have about 10% of the um, loggerhead turtles of the Mediterranean nest in Cyprus and about 30% of the, the green turtles nest here. And since we started monitoring in 1992, the numbers of nests stayed quite constant for the first decade or so. Um, but during, during the most recent monitoring, we've seen the response of the conservation efforts. So um, what we think is happening is that the 
um, because of the protection of nests from predation by screening them with uh, metal cages. Um, the nest numbers have started to come back up now because those protected nests, the hatchlings have gone into the sea in, in larger numbers because of the conservation. Uh, they've gone through the gauntlet of threats that, um, that Paolo's uh, uh, discussed with fisheries and um, uh, Doan with uh, plastic pollution and, uh, and other, other threats and more turtles are starting to come through um, the other side. So that, that conservation uh, effort on the nesting beaches is really important and it's starting to show its effect. But why, why should we track turtles? Diane's already touched on this. Um, it's important to understand the marine areas that sea turtles use um, and then to reduce the threats in those existing areas. For example, through the establishment of marine protected areas um, and fisheries management within those areas. Um, and also to understand and predict their reaction to environmental change because the, uh, the areas that they're using currently, they may not be there forever the way things are going with, with climate change. Um, and so we can, sat we can satellite track turtles that are caught in fisheries. So the picture on the left hand side you can see is a loggerhead turtle, uh, which has been caught in a fishing net. Um, and generally um, we're using this kind of uh, method to, um, to understand turtles that are the, the areas that turtles are using in the foraging area. So we're tracking them from within the, the, the foraging area. Um, or we can test track them from nesting beaches. Um, so the below picture is um, a nesting female loggerhead, which was tracked from the nesting beach, Allegheny. Um, and the above picture on the right hand side is a, is a male green turtle, which was uh, captured in the nesting area off the beach. Um, most commonly, uh, sea turtles are tracked from the nesting beach because they come out onto the beach. Um, it's easy to kill, it's easy to find them. You can walk along the beach, see the tracks, the turtle, monitor them, and then attach the, the transmitter um, once they've laid their eggs. Um, and as you can see, the transmitter is generally attached to a carapace with this uh, epoxy resin. It's, uh, it's like a kind of uh, liquid plastic um, combined with uh, some fiberglass. And the, the, the devices can stay on for five years um, or more. So since uh, 2001 uh, in Northern Cyprus, we've tracked 37 nesting loggerhead turtles from different nesting beaches across Northern Cyprus. Um, and to begin with, in this figure, you can see the light gray shaded um, tracks. Uh, the turtles were using um, an area around Cyprus. So some of them were remaining in Cyprus. Some were going to Syria, Lebanon, uh, Israel, Egypt, uh, a small number in Libya and quite a lot around the Tunisian plateau. Um, but as the numbers of turtles have increased in more recent years, um, we've tracked um, further turtles and um, we're finding that as the population increases, um, we're finding um, turtles going to different areas. So now we have some, as Diana said, um, going into the um, Aegean, into the Adriatic, um, and even one that went all the way from Cyprus um, through as far as into Spanish waters. Um, <coughs> which is quite impressive and probably one of the, the longest tracks of, of, of the turtle tracked in the, in the Mediterranean. Um, so this uh, difference that we are seeing in the, as time goes on, as we track more turtles, uh, new sort of foraging areas, these could be related to climate change. Um, and we're also seeing sort of some behaviors that are more indicative of younger turtles. So in general, loggerhead turtles as adults, they dive down to the seabed and they feed on the bottom. So they, they tend to go to areas uh, where um, there's some shallow water and they can dive down to um, within about 100 meters and feed on hard shelled animals. Um, but as juveniles, they uh, wander around and make these roaming movements in um, offshore habitats in deep waters. Um, and the population structure is becoming more dominated by young individuals um, as the numbers of turtles go up. Um, in response to conservation efforts. So um, it may be that we're starting to see um, some of those sort of more juvenile behaviors in, in the younger um, turtles that we're seeing. And when we're looking at um, green turtles, which um, I'm gonna focus on in, in a bit more depth, um, we initially, we um, satellite tracked 22 green turtles from Allegheny Beach. Uh, which is the main study site that we work at in uh, Northern Cyprus. And we, we began that work in uh, 1998. And up until two 2010, um, this, this was the available knowledge on the, the turtle, the green turtle foraging areas. So green turtles dive down and feed on the bottom 
uh, like adult loggerhead turtles, but they use much shallower areas. And um, because they feed on seagrass, and seagrass um, occurs in uh, quite shallow waters. So <clears throat> you can see in Libya, there are two clear sites here um, where six turtles and seven turtles uh, used. And then there's an area around Turkey and Cyprus where um, we had four turtles uh, staying there. And then a small number stayed <clears throat> in Egypt. So the, there are these kind of, it's quite a small number of uh, foraging sites when you consider um, all of the individuals are sort of restricted to these little clusters of uh, they're really overlapping in these um, small number of foraging sites. But then after the first study, we, um, we realized through a forensic method called the stable isotope analysis. So at Alagadi, we also um, have a night pat nighttime patrol team on the beach and we um, we tag all of the turtles that are on the beach. So all of the females that come to Alagadi are known and we have a long-term database with the, his with the history of all those individuals. And um, so we can see which turtles are coming and going through their little individual passports. Um, and we did this uh, forensic uh, method called uh, stable isotope analysis. Um, and we realized through this uh, forensics that we were able to, without having satellite track the turtles, we can distinguish turtles that are going to this West Libya area, turtles that are going to this Bomba Gulf area, turtles that are going to uh, Egypt area, and turtles that are remaining around Cyprus and Turkey. So we have these four distinct uh, foraging areas, which now, because we've done the satellite transmitted work and we've taken the samples from the turtles, we are able to look at the broader population because satellite, transmit, satellite telemetry is very expensive. It costs about, um, two to three thousand pounds to track uh, an individual turtle. So, so the sample size is very small, which limits the experiment. Um, so after 2011, in 2015, one of our uh, PhD students, uh, Philip Bradshaw, looked at this uh, forensic evidence and he looked at the database of turtles that we have and he examined hundreds of uh, individual turtles um, and, and looked at the areas that they were going to, the signatures in their tissues he was able to um, identify which foraging sites they were going to. And he realized that uh, more than 40% of the turtles were going to this foraging site here. Although at that point, we hadn't tracked any turtles to um, many turtles to Egypt and we didn't have um, a signature for that point. So we didn't actually know where it was. Uh, so in 2015, we selected five individual turtles from our database based on the forensic analysis that we did on their tissues and we satellite tracked those five individuals and we, we realized that they were all going to this foraging site here, um, which is Lake Bardawal in, uh, in Egypt. And then subsequently um, in 2018 and 2019, we, we tracked 20 more green turtles from the Carpaz Peninsula, which is, a, which is another um, nesting ground in uh, Northern Cyprus. Um, it's one of the most important nesting grounds in the Mediterranean. It's quite a dense nesting area with um, more than 500 nests there every year at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and we realized that a huge proportion of those were going to Lake Bardawal. Um, so um, those other foraging sites, not really important at all, none staying in Turkey and um, Cyprus any longer. Um, the other foraging areas uh, are not particularly important any longer. Most of the, the, the turtles are foraging in Lake Bardewell. Um, in, in one year, nine out of 10 um, turtles that we tracked went into Lake Bardewell. So um, you can imagine what an important site it was. If anything ever happened to that foraging area, um, we could see a huge, huge reduction in the numbers of green turtles and we'd be back to square one um, in terms of um, the recovery, back to pre-recovery level. So it's a really important area. Um, and looking at the, the size and the, um, the, the situation with that foraging area in particular, it's an inland lagoon. So the turtles are actually passing through a narrow um, inlet, going into this lagoon and spending their time in an area which is extremely small. So um, the fact that um, more than 50% of the green turtles um, that are nesting in Cyprus are living in this small landlocked area um, demonstrates that they have quite low resilience to climate change because um, through sea level rise, increased storminess um, and other human threats, 
for example, um, oil spills, uh, fisheries threats in, in those areas. Um, if those aren't mitigated, then um, we could really, really have a serious problem for the, for the uh, Mediterranean green turtle population. I just want to say a big thank you again to um, all of our uh, collaborators, for the, um, to the North Cyprus Ministry for uh, Tourism and Environment, um, and uh, to all of our sponsors, um, and to the, uh, the organisers of the conference, and to Professor Jakub Kaska. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Robin. It's really important to track the turtles and also look at their isotope levels and uh, combine this information together and uh, to, to identify hotspots in the Mediterranean. Obviously, the food item they eat is also bringing their body isotopes, but they are bringing also some plastics. Now, the next speaker is uh, Emily Duncan from Exeter University. She will be talking about the turtles and the plastics. And uh, please, Emily, uh, make your presentation to us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, just checking, you can hear me all right? Yes. OK, thank you very much for having me um, and uh, allowing me to be um, part of this uh, panel today. Um, yeah, I'm Emily Duncan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Exeter. Um, and I'll be briefly outlining uh, plastic ingestion in marine turtles with a focus on uh, sea turtles in the Mediterranean. Um, so due to the huge increase uh, in the use of plastic in our daily lives and also uh, mismanagement of waste, uh, its spatial distribution and abundance at sea is ever increasing. And plastic pollution is known to threaten marine megafauna, such as sea turtles, cetaceans, seabirds, and fish, through ingestion, entanglement, wider ecosystem effects, and habitat degradation. And now all species of marine turtle at all life stages have now been shown to be ingesting macroplastics, but the, uh, but the ocean is also experiencing pollution from microplastics. So these are anything technically under five millimetres in length, but they can be micrometres in size. And I'll be mentioning these in a little bit. So marine turtles are particularly vulnerable to the threat of um, plastic pollution due to their use of multiple marine habitats. For example, um, nesting in coastal waters, um, and foraging there and also using beaches to nest. And I think this has been outlined um, by the previous speakers, how they use uh, many habitats within the marine realm. They have a complex life history, um, which has been discussed as well. And uh, this makes it difficult for us to detect impacts and also their highly migratory behavior across the world's oceans, which we've seen today. Um, while we understand that all species of marine turtle are ingesting macroplastics, so larger pieces of plastic, we still don't really understand the biological mechanisms behind why this is occurring. So there are two main uh, visual hypotheses why marine turtles may ingest um, macroplastics. So the first one is being the active selectivity hypothesis. So this states that sea turtles are ingesting plastics because um, they mistake it directly as a food item. So it's targeted as a mistaken prey item. And the other one is the accidental or opportunistic hypothesis. So this states that sea turtles don't actively target plastic to ingest, but this occurs by accident um, because it's mixed up in uh, dietary items that are already present. So when we want to explore this, we want to think about uh, marine turtle foraging decision rules. So colour um, and shape are really important in marine turtle foraging. They're very visual predators. So if we use uh, this to look at uh, marine plastics uh, that we find ingested in sea turtles, this might give us an understanding of if or why marine turtles are ingesting pl plastic. So this, uh, we conducted a study uh, based in um, the Eastern Mediterranean, um, along with SPOT, um, as Robin has just mentioned in his talk. Um, and we looked at plastic ingestion in uh, green turtles um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so all turtles in this study had um, ingested marine plastic. 
um, and uh, the largest amount being 183 pieces of plastic in a juvenile green turtle. And that turtle had very uh, little dietary items um, alongside the plastic. Um, and we looked at this with a really high level, um, high resolution classification system. So as well as using standard ways at looking at the type of plastic ingested, we also looked at the color and shape of plastic ingested. And comparing this to environmental availability, this allowed us to calculate these selection ratios, which you see on the screen now. So any value above one indicates a positive active selection towards, um, towards that characteristic in the plastic. And anything below one indicates a sort of avoidance or non-selection of that characteristic. So firstly, we have the type of plastic. Um, so green turtles in the Eastern Mediterranean showed strong selection towards sheet and thread like plastic. So anything like plastic bag or small pieces of rope. And then uh, showed avoidance to foamed plastics such as polystyrene, to industrial nurdle pellets, hard fragments of plastic and other things such as uh, rubber balloons. And then when we look at um, selection towards colour, the green turtle showed a selection towards black, clear and green plastics, a slight selection towards pink, brown and yellow plastics, and a seemingly avoidance to white, red, grey, orange and blue plastics. And finally, to look at shape, we calculated length to width rate ratios. So any value closer to zero indicated a long, thin piece of plastic and any value nearer to one indicated a square or circular shaped piece of plastic. And as you can see from the graph, there is really strong selection towards um, lower width length ratios, which are longer, thinner pieces of plastic. So therefore, it is thought that the green turtles in the Eastern Mediterranean could potentially be ingesting plastics that resemble their food, main food item, as Robin discussed earlier, as seagrass. So first of all, plastic ingested was longer, more pliable, thin pieces of plastic, which represents seagrass in shape and texture. And the color selected also more closely resemble this dietary item. However, further investigation is needed on this. It was also there poss therefore possible that other species in the Mediterranean, such, that, such as the loggerhead, are uh, selectively ingesting plastics that more closely resemble um, their main dietary items, such as crustaceans. Um, however, we need to look at this on a species by species basis. As I mentioned earlier, as well as macroplastics, so larger pieces of plastic polluting the world's oceans, um, the oceans are now experiencing pollution from microplastics. So these, as I said, are technically anything under five millimeters in length but they can be really, really tiny um, and micrometers in size. So you would need a microscope to see them. Um, when we started this work um, a few years ago, we didn't even know whether turtles were ingesting microplastics. So we exposed their gut contents residue samples to an enzymatic digestion process that colleagues had previously looked, um, looked at zooplankton microplastic ingestion using this technique. And it allows for the um, isolation um, of these synthetic particles by removing the biological material on these filters, um, potentially isolating these synthetic particles such as this fibre here. So this uh, study was conducted over three ocean basins, so broadening out for the Mediterranean for a minute. Um, in the Atlantic, on the east coast of America, um, in the Mediterranean, um, with samples from Cyprus, and on the east coast of Australia, with samples from Queensland. And it covered all uh, species of marine turtle. So as you can see, we've got uh, firstly Atlantic species, then Mediterranean species, and finally um, the Pacific species. And as you can see, the number of particles on average was higher in the Mediterranean samples than in the um, Atlantic or Pacific samples. But it's important to note that all turtles um, of over 100 samples in the study had, ha had um, synthetic particles present in their gut content. 
Um, in terms of the type of particles that we saw ingested, um, the majority were small fibrous pieces of microplastic, um, followed by small fragments and uh, microbeads, um, which are either used in cleaning products or cosmetics sometimes, were only found in Pacific samples. Um, and when we look at the colours, um, the majority are blue and black followed by red and clear. And this really mirrors um, many studies on microplastics, not in just in marine turtles, but other species as well. During this work, it's really important for us to look at the polymer makeup of some of these particles that we are finding. And this helps us understand where they may be coming from originally. Um, a lot of particles in this study gave readings for polyethylene tetraphthalate, which is used in many single uh, use uh, packaging items such as plastic bottles and also polyester fibers, which is found in a lot of the clothes that we um, currently wear. So it's really important that we can kind of close the loop and look at potential solutions by understanding where the majority of these synthetic particles are coming from. In terms of ingestion pathways and differences between species, um, it's been shown that microplastics could potentially adhere to the surface of seagrass, so therefore be ingested by green turtles this way in the Mediterranean. However, um, loggerheads could be exposed through a process of trophic transfer of contaminated prey. Again, um, the, both species could be exposed by contaminated seawater or sediments as they are benthic feeding. Um, however, this needs further investigation. Finally, when we think about the associated um, pathology um, and potential health impacts on marine turtles, this is really where our research needs to go. Um, there's a potential that the uh, ingestion of macroplastics could cause uh, ulcerations, uh, lethal um, lacerations to the gut and blockages. However, this could lead to increased morbidity and mortality. But it's really hard to attribute death to plastics because of the lack of associated pathology. So we really need to work closer with veterinarians from around the world um, to help identify causes of death due to plastic. Secondly, um, uh, we have to think about the possible uh, exposure to harmful pollutants such as persistent organic pollutants. Um, it's potentially that um, plastics are ingested alongside absorbed harmful uh, contaminants such as organochlorines or PCBs, and this allows for a pathway of bioaccumulation in marine turtles. Finally, it is thought that the ingestion of plastic could lead towards dietary dilution, malnutrition and starvation of turtles, potentially having impacts on growth and survivorship. And when we think about this in a population context, it could be harmful if pelagic post hatchlings are not recruiting to breeding populations um, due to this impact. However, further research is needed into all these areas. I just want to say a big thank you to all the co authors, uh, funders, and collaborators that made all of this work possible that I mentioned today. Um, thank you for listening and thank you for having me on the panel, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for your nice presentation, giving overall picture of the plastic interaction with the sea turtles. Now we have another speaker covering the similar topic, but related to the climate change, especially. We have Nicole Esteban from Swansea University. She will be talking about plastic and the climate change, how it is related, synergi synergistic occurrence of the sea turtles under these two topics. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks very much, Jakob. And thank you very much for hosting me today, uh, part of this panel to discuss the effects of climate change on sea turtles. And I'll hopefully build on what Emily's just been talking about and not duplicate. Uh, by focusing a little bit more on climate change and plastics and the 
um, fact that they play roles as synergistic ocean stressors to sea turtles. So I work with uh, people around the world uh, in the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean specifically. So I'll, I'll give some examples from the broader ocean basins, uh, as well as um, kind of recalling what we've been talking about for the Mediterranean. So just to set the context, uh, as Emily and others discussed, uh, turtles uh, live in a variety of different habitats during their life cycle, which is pretty complex. So um, it starts from the top right as they emerge in the beach as hatchlings and, um, and go off uh, in the ocean gyres um, with the currents. And uh, they spend so-called lost years uh, for several years at sea before uh, settling at shallow foraging sites uh, known as developmental sites such as this lagoon in the Indian Ocean on the back on the uh, backdrop photo and um, and the Hawksbill photo in the bottom right and uh, in the bottom and then the green turtle in the bottom left uh, forage in these shallow habitats which are really critical and uh, not only forage in those habitats but also have a daily shuttle between two habitats such as the green turtle here that shuttles between the daily foraging in very open seagrass habitat on flat open seabed uh, and then goes to the more complex um, coral reef area to lodge underneath coral reef to rest at night time to prevent it um, from emerging to the surface and being more exposed to predators. So they use these complex habitats um, during their foraging time. And then once they reach um, sufficient body reserves, uh, they migrate every two to six years, uh, depending on species, uh, to their natal grounds where they breed. Uh, so you can see the uh, mating turtles at the top there, and then the females go to the beach to lay her eggs multiple times um, over several months before then returning to foraging grounds. So plastics are affecting turtles across life stages, but hopefully this image also shows that it's across habitats, which is really critical in terms of protecting turtles. And um, we're starting to see that plastics are not only in densely populated regions like the Mediterranean, but they're found piling up on the beaches in really remote uninhabited islands such as these ones in the Indian Ocean. And, um, and what we see now is that turtles are affected in these remote areas such as this hatchling uh, becoming trapped by uh, plastics on the beach and uh, dying due to heat exhaustion before it enters the sea. Um, this hawksbill that ingested fishing line probably with bait on the end um, and uh, swimming around, unable to swim properly or to feed properly because its head was um, kind of stuck towards its rear flipper, uh, towards its flipper. And then um, photos such as this with turtles that we're seeing washing up on the beach, uh, mature turtles uh, that are becoming entangled in fishing net uh, and then resulting in amputation of flippers as that fishing net kind of cauterizes uh, around the flipper. And um, not only does plastic uh, play a role, but then climate change is fundamentally linked to plastics, where um, plastic manufacture and through the life cycle of, many of plastics is contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, large percentages of greenhouse emissions are due to plastics. Um, but they're playing, of course, a, a dual effect, plastics and climate change. Um, affecting turtles and other marine megafauna. And uh, climate change is ultimately exacerbating plastic pollution because um, events such as extreme weather events uh, rapidly uh, cause plastics to arrive in the ocean. So, um, so it's critical not just to look at plastics or climate change in isolation, but to look at all of the stresses. And so we've started uh, to do that. And um, one thing uh, to mention is um, we, we've looked at green turtle diet around the world at all of these locations of foraging uh, locations for green turtles. And we we're able to see there's a relationship of 
uh, sea surface temperature to diet. So the warmer areas typically are a, uh, green turtles have a plant-based diet, such as uh, seagrass and algae and sometimes mangroves. Um, but in the cooler areas, uh, green turtles tend to have an increased proportion of animal matter in their diet. Um, and so those are circles with uh, black circles with increased animal matter. Um, and then to add to that, um, in beaches such as Cyprus, um, uh, Emily reported um, over 45,000 particles per square meter in the top two centimeters of sand. Um, in the Galapagos, really remote areas, hundreds of particles per cubic uh, per square meter. And then in the Chagos also, remote islands and um, 20 bottles, 20 plastic bottles per square meter of uh, turtle nesting area. So staggering amounts of plastics in these areas, not only in um, densely populated regions, but also remote areas of the world. And we've been tracking uh, green turtles in the Indian Ocean and uh, able to report that um, in the Western Indian Ocean, turtles are migrating up to 5,000 kilometers. So all the way from the Chagos Archipelago uh, in blue shading um, to as far as Mozambique, Somalia and Kenya. And um, this shows you that it's not a local issue um, when we look at conservation of turtles with regard to plastics and climate change, um, but it's actually um, an international issue. And uh, turtles, as they migrate in open ocean, are, incre are increasingly facing uh, increasing levels of plastics, um, climate change that's affecting their diet resource availability, also shifting their habitats uh, and sea level rise, um, but also increasing fishing bycatch, which has been seen. So global action is needed, um, and we're currently working to link movements to threat levels uh, with uh, collaborators around the world. So one of these examples is overlaying uh, stresses to sea turtles and other marine megafauna like seabirds, uh, cetaceans, um, and, uh, and looking at um, the top left, uh, plastic density. So that map shows a heat map of where most plastics have been modeled to be by seeding plastics in ocean circulation models. And then the bottom left uh, showing a heat map of global warming. And, uh, and then when you overlay it over the tracks of uh, marine vertebrates, so such as blue sharks, leatherback, and loggerhead turtles in the North Atlantic, you can start to locate the pinch points of where um, these anthropogenic stresses are interacting with uh, marine megafauna. So that's really critical for assessing movement against the different threat levels. So back to the beaches, uh, we're looking at um, how plastics are playing another stressor for sea turtles. And um, Professor Kazga talked about temperature sex determination, where increasing temperature is leading to increased feminization of turtle populations. And, um, and this graph shows how over time, the um, incubation temperature of a really one of the most important loggerhead rookeries in the world at Cape Verde in the Atlantic, um, you're seeing the, um, the temperatures are greater than 29 degrees. So that's the magical pivotal temperature where there'll be a balanced sex ratio of 50% male and 50% female. So anything over the 29 degrees leads to um, more females emerging from the beach. And we um, looked at various uh, rookeries for turtles around the world um, in, and, uh, and investigated the relationship of sand temperature to air temperature. So to see whether climate change with um, the predicted air temperature would have an effect on sea turtle sex ratio. And all of these uh, locations show a positive relationship. So uh, air temperature rising significantly. And uh, St. Eustatius, which is the top line, the yellow line in the Caribbean, um, already has uh, incubation temperatures at over 29 degrees. And that sea turtle population 
um, from our studies is 100% feminine already, um, hatchlings coming out. So what to do? So I've got a couple of slides to end with on positive news stories. Um, and uh, the first is that we investigated in Synthesis on the island with complete feminization, whether we could do simple treatments to um, cool the temperatures of nests by shading and uh, relocation of nests. Others have also looked at watering of nests and they have successfully reduced temperatures uh, for turtles. Um, we can also remove obstructions for nests. So beach cleanups are really successful for helping not only um, remove obstructions from nesting, but also for hatchlings emerging. And we also reviewed how satellite tracking studies and animal movement studies have been used around the world to really play a role in pushing for conservation policy and management. And we were able to report 32 studies where animal tracking has been used successfully uh, in policy, either to um, address where are specific threats to marine megafauna or um, to designate where marine protected areas can be established in, cons in foraging hotspots, for example. And our results in the Western Indian Ocean have been used by the Republic of Seychelles to um, help designate uh, their marine protected area zones. So, um, so we're able to connect the dots between scientists and policymakers for um, helping conserve megafauna. So on that note, I'll just say a personal message that everyone here and listening can play a positive role in plastic pollution. 50% uh, of plastics manufactured are disposable single-use plastics, such as plastic bottles. So everyone can reject using um, disposable plastic. Please do, or choose the alternative of recycled packaging. But that's just a personal message. Thank you very much for hosting me today and for all the collaborators that I work with. Ah, thank you, Nicole with the positive messages to ending the, the speech. And uh, finally, I would like to thank again all the speakers of this panel, uh, Paolo Casale, uh, Emily Duncan, and uh, Robin Snape has connected with, uh, to us uh, via online, and uh, uh, Doan Sözbilen and Nicole Esteban uh, physically here. And uh, as we can see, is the climate change and the temperature issue is very important, and the plastic pollution is really important to monitor. And uh, we would be very happy to answer if you have any, any questions, uh, either to me or to the speakers of this panel. If not, I would like to say again that this uh, panel is recorded and it will be uh, uploaded to the YouTube channel and it will be continuous. And uh, for giving this opportunity to us, I would like to thank again Turkish Minister of Environment and urbanization with climate change. And the Minister uh, Murat Kurum and the Vice Minister Mehmet Emin Birpunar, they are really interested in sea turtles and they, they are really supporting our activities. Without their support, we wouldn't be here to, today to have this panel. And uh, this is very important that the Turkish government really uh, supporting our activities in terms of the protection of the sea turtles, especially on the specially protected areas. And uh, as we hosted International Sea Turtle Symposium a couple of years ago in Turkey, we are following the up-to-date information and uh, we are doing our best. And the uh, collaboration is very important, as Doan mentioned. Life Met Turtle Project is actually coordinated by the Paolo Casale, uh, which is the life uh, project. And uh, we are also a uh, partnership with the Emily Duncan in other project that uh, uh, European Union also supported Indicit project. And also MAVA Foundation is supporting our activities, conservation of the marine turtles, and also bycatch project, uh, both of which also Robin uh, Snape is also uh, collaborating with us. And uh, the, the, by mentioning this, I would like to thank also MAVA Foundation for supporting us to come over here and uh, do the collaboration work with these uh, partners.
And uh, thank you again for all the uh, speakers and uh, thank you for all staying with us uh, at this time of the night at this COP26 and uh, hope that we can have a better future for both ourselves and for the turtles. Thank you. <laughs>